Welcome, everybody. Today, we have a remarkable show for you. We have an international thought leader. He is of such renown, especially in the sports and entertainment space. He is the original Jerry Maguire. No, not Tom Cruise. This is David Meltzer. He is a remarkable person who has a story that you would just be inspired by. He is the uh, was the CEO of the Lee Steinberg Marketing uh, Company, an entertainment agency, which was the inspiration for the movie Jerry Maguire. And he's going to tell us how that uh, nomenclature came about. So delighted that he's with us today. I'm Lorraine Siegel. I'm the founder, chair, and CEO of the Exceptional Women Awardees Foundation. We enable high-level women to rise to meet their dreams. I never had a coach when I was early in my career as a lawyer and then as a CEO and eventually as a board director. And I wanted to make sure that women who walked the road less traveled as I had would always have a network surrounding them of women peers who would enable them to reach their dreams. And that's exactly what we do at the Exceptional Women Awardees Foundation. We also find thought leaders who are generous enough to give us some of their time to help us learn from their experiences and their huge success. And so before I introduce the amazing David Meltzer, I'm going to show you a short video of his signature program. Let's see it now. This is Office Hours, where the brightest entrepreneurial minds in business, sports, and entertainment get together to talk about success, failure, and everything in between. Take a deep dive into the mindset it takes to excel as our unbelievable hosts and guests share with you the strategies and tools they've used to dominate their respective fields. On this episode of Office Hours, Denica Patrick, Jimmy Mystery, Sadhguru, Zach Weiner and Rory Kutaya. How do you decide what it is you're going to be passionate about? Well, I don't think I decide. I think that's the point. I think you find it. Literally anyone could be their own QVC or home shopping network. What's your mindset when you're building a company? If you do not invent misery, you will be happy. I love that. He's approaching business as a spiritual discipline. David Meltzer hosts Office Hours. Amazing. Amazing, amazing, David, really incredible. How did the Jerry Maguire nomenclature come about and stick? You know, it's a really interesting story because Cameron Crowe, who I think wrote, you know, and produced one of the most fantastic love stories ever, uh, really utilized sports as a backdrop uh, to a love story, which made it one of the most popular sports films that really isn't a sports film. Uh, it's a love story. And so uh, Cameron Crowe followed Lee Steinberg, uh, and I was CEO of Lee Steinberg's agency, and built the film off of really a different perspective of, of a scarce profession. And that was this abundance of changing the world and how money interplayed with the context of business, one of the most competitive businesses, sports agentry, and how doing good and doing well reconcile each other as a backdrop to this tremendous love story and some terrific writing, by the way, I still, I, I'm so proud of the movie Jerry Maguire for one reason. I think it has the most one-liners that are still used today over 25 years later. Everybody still knows, show me the money. You had me at hello, I'm best in the living room. All these great, there's probably 20 of them that are still used today. There's no question about it. And I watched that movie over and over again. I absolutely love it. And it's just, it, it touches the heart in so many ways. And that is truly brilliant writing. Uh, David, your story is equally touching to the heart. Uh, you know, the first time I met you, you were a generous donor to the last school where I was running a competition and you donated some of the prize money. And I'm forever grateful to you for that. But I also know that you left law school after graduating at the age of 32, you built an estate of $100 million, and then you lost it. What happened? Tell us something about that story. Yeah. You know what happened is three letters happened, E-G-O. And I had to go through my journey of lessons in order to understand how I was edging goodness out of my life, how I edged the gold out of my life. Uh, I lived my entire life trying to get happy, trying to get wealthy, trying to get uh you know, uh, worthy. And what I realized through this tremendous lesson of, I call it investing over a hundred million dollars. Most people call it bankruptcy, but I considered that it as an investment to my future was that 
the lesson learned was I am happy, healthy, wealthy, and worthy. I just had to figure out what I was doing to interfere with it. And this shift in my paradigm that reconciled the currency of money, the object of energy that we put into the flow to get what we want on earth with a different currency based off of a very simple yet spiritual pragmatic idea that one, there's something bigger than me. And two, that which is bigger than me loves me more than my mom loves me. And so once I reconciled the two currencies of faith and money, I was able to create a different world for myself, not the world of not enough, where I was a victim, things happened to me, as is when I was a child growing up with no money, a single mom and six kids, not just that second world of just enough, where I was a philanthropist, a humanitarian, but I was living the zoo sum game of the more I gave, the more I should receive, everything was a trade or a negotiation. But because of this shift in my perspective and paradigm, utilizing gratitude, empathy, accountability, and I was able to create a new world of a value add game, not a zero sum game, a value add game where there was more than enough of everything for everyone. So when I gave, it added to the universe. And when I received, it added to the universe. And this at its core is the foundation of my perception and my perspective that created my new reality. Amazing, David. You know, there are people coming in from all over North America and the world, in fact, so if some of them will come up, we'll say hi to them. Uh, and, and welcome the questions from our audience, please. Uh, don't be shy. Put your questions in and, uh, and we'll be sure to try and answer them. David, the, the big issue today, and I'm a public board director and I know you know many and have many uh, accomplishments yourself in, in the area of the public world as well, it's ESG. That's what everybody's talking about. You were way ahead of your time. You wrote the book Compassionate, Compassionate Capitalism, and that really could have been ESG as the title. Why were you so far ahead, and how has that conversation changed in the present? The idea between passion and capitalism was that instead of appreciating how we are the same, I really focused in on appreciating how we're different. So it wasn't good enough to appreciate how we're the same, but yet really focus and try to find the light, the love and the lessons in our superpowers, in our differences. And in order to do so, we had to uh, early on understand what today is ESG, that we are all including, inclusive of one another. I am blessed to have learned the lessons by not only being married for so long, but having three beautiful daughters uh, that have helped me understand and appreciate the differences between men and women, for example, and understand how we are connected and we are the same, but more importantly, appreciating the difference. What does that mean? We should be adding value to the differences that we have, that we should be moving weaknesses and to a different place where it creates a strength. And that's what the Compassionate Capitalism book is, is a book that helps people to see things or change the way they look at things so the things they look at change. So David, take it down to the practical because people are working in jobs, they're working overtime, they're remotely coming in to meet their teams, they're trying to struggle with children at home and ambitions to get promoted. How do you apply your, your philosophy to that kind of humdrum existence where you can barely breathe and think philosophically. Yeah, well, I break it down to daily practices. And those daily practices take into account our new year resolutions. It takes into account our midterm objectives or even our long term objectives. But in essence, we're given 24 hours a day of activity that we have planned. We don't have planned 24 hours a day of activity we get paid for and we don't get paid for 24 hours a day where we need sleep which is a major focus of what I do and uh, utilizing an unwinding routine to start my tomorrow today by effectuating sleep, which is the most underused asset that we have. It's so unfortunate that the majority of the people on earth go to sleep at night and wake up more tired than when they went to bed. That's foolish going out to eat for two hours and ending up hungry. It doesn't make any sense to me. But being able to utilize the 24 hours a day of activity with five daily practices in order to be more productive, to provide more value, to be more accessible, connected to more people, but also access or receive more and more gracious 
to be able to find the light, the love, and the lessons in what we do. And so I created these five pragmatic practices that I give away to everyone. I write about them in my books. and I encourage anyone out there to email me. I'll be happy to send you the five daily practices of knowing your what, your who, your how, your now, and applying your why. And I email there, david at dmeltzer.com for anyone interested in those five daily practices. I would love that also. I'm going to make sure that I do that. Give us one, David, just one. So my, my favorite is applying our why. So many of us, as I suggest, are searching for their why. They're searching for happiness, health, wealth, and worthiness. And the fifth step, after you know what you want, who can help you, who you can help, how to get it done and prioritize that by what's important in knowing your now, applying your why changes your life. So what I do is teach a four-stepped pragmatic approach of one, identifying what it is that interferes with you and your potential. Here's some of the things that I have realized in my life. One, the need to be right, the need to be offended, the need to be separate, inferior or superior, the need to be anxious, frustrated, angry, guilty, resentful, you know, the need to worry. Worrying's duplicative in its negative nature because not only is it interfering with your health, happiness, wealth, and worthiness, but it actually is manifesting or wishing for what you don't want. And how much time, energy, emotion, and money do we spend worrying? What I teach people in the context of applying our why is one, identify these ego-based consciousnesses and instead of fighting it, resisting it, going over it, under it, through it, around it, lying to it, manipulating, cheating, overselling, and back-end selling it, simply stop, right? Utilize surrender in us to stop, breathe through our nose, out through our mouth, and then remind ourselves of the what, the who, the how, and the now, and roll in the right trajectory. In other words, if we can identify the ego, if we can identify the interference, we know that our mind, our body, and our soul are on fire when we're in ego-based consciousness, when we're worried and angry and frustrated and guilty and resentful. If we stop, when we're on fire, drop and roll, just like our moms taught us, catch on fire, you gotta stop, drop and roll, we can accelerate, grow, and expand aligned with synergistic and supplementary to an expanding, growing uh, universe and living in this value add game, not a zero sum game. It's amazing, David. I mean, you're like a corporate psychologist in a way. Uh, you've created a, a, a vision into the inner mind and soul of human beings and uh, help them discover themselves, which is pretty remarkable. And those five daily practices that you do every day, do your daughters do them too? So first of all, my kids like yours probably and those other kids out there, they don't listen to me, but they watch me. And so uh, I never, ever tell them what to do. I will explain situationally what I've learned from things that have happened to me to better equip them to make their own decisions. But I will tell you that I do a Instagram live on Sundays with my son, who's only 11. And in me so fulfilled. Somebody asked us a question on the Instagram live. What is the purpose of life? And I immediately answered without thinking kindness. You know, if we can be kind to our future selves, do good deeds, that this is where the truth lies to be kind, to acknowledge, appreciate, and ask how we're connected and remind, remember, and recollect the collective consciousness. My son looks at me and he says, no, dad, the purpose of life is lessons. You should know that. And I almost teared up because, you know, they don't listen to me, but obviously through what they watch, either me in person or even some of my videos, uh, they learn these practices. And eventually at the right place at the perfect time, I imagine not only will they utilize the five daily practices, but my bigger vision is that they will enhance and teach me how my five ba basic ba daily practices are rudimentary and they come up with a much simpler, easier way to help empower people to happiness, make a lot of money, help a lot of people and have a lot of fun. Well, you know, our mission is to change lives one woman at a time uh, and we could change that to change lives one person at a time. We have a number of questions out there, so let's bring on one of them, which is a very interesting one from Susan Holiday. Celebrating differences is great, isn't it? Also more important to find common ground with diverse friends and colleagues. Should we celebrate what we have in common even more? What do you think, David? I always say make yourself equal before we appreciate the differences. And so I think 
Uh, there's no more or less of, of either one. There's just the positive perspective of one having the ability to find the, the love and laughter and, uh, lessons in our similarities and differences, also to institute forgiveness. Uh, you know, a lot of the things that are happening today in inclusion, in uh, the separation or equality and equity uh, is a matter of understanding, unlearning things, right? I am, you know, obviously a white middle-aged man and I have a lot of things to unlearn. There's things that I do with the best intentions that I have to unlearn. And I think if we put things into this context of not what's more important or less important, but understanding this common ground of similarities and differences, see that it can be common ground in differences as easy as it can be in similarities. Uh, and I think making ourselves equal is very important first before we can appreciate the differences and we can do so with the right mindset, the right heart set, and of course, the right practices, what I call handset. Yeah, I would say physician heal thyself. We have another wonderful question which just came in. So let's take a look at that. That's from Nicole Galil. Thanks, Nicole. David said he got in his way to happiness success. What was the biggest change you made, David, in your life and business, business or personal, that helped you make the shift? Well, it really had to do with my relationship with money because I believe that money bought happiness and was the indicator of my success. Um, and through losing everything, through the journey and the lessons that I've learned, I had to redevelop or re-engineer my relationship to money. I didn't agree with the fact that money wasn't important, but I also had to reconcile that money did not buy happiness or success, even though you know, my goal at five years old was to buy my mom a house and a car. I did everything I was able to make a lot of money so I could buy her that house and car. I was able to do that nine months out of law school. I became a multimillionaire. By the time I was 30, everything in my life confirmed that money bought happiness and was my success. And so for me, the biggest change that I had to make was in my relationship with money was that money no longer could buy happiness or success but it allowed me to shop. And so when I started to institute value and practices so that I shopped for the right things with the right reasons, then I could be happy and successful. So to reconcile that currency of money and object of energy that I put into the flow to get what I want with my faith of doing the right thing by doing good deeds, by being grateful, forgiving, accountable, and insp inspirational, then I was able to see what is the relationship to money, to my happiness and success that goes beyond just being able to buy it. But it was something that could be utilized as an object of energy to facilitate shopping for what I wanted for the right reasons. So, David, when you look at the world of sports marketing and entertainment, how does all of that fit into what you really have, which is a generic philosophy on life? How do they inter integrate and intertwine in your life? You know, it's so interesting because with sports and entertainment, uh, I see it as that backdrop, as a bug light that brings us together. Um, and the reason is, is that sports and entertainment has five components. They have credibility. It has an emotional attachment. It has a quantitative value or reasons why people enjoy it and to create the community. It also has an impact. And then it has certain features and benefits, skills, knowledge that align with this desire. And so for me, utilizing sports and entertainment is the same as Jerry Maguire. I utilize it as a backdrop or a bug light to what's important to me, to empower people with values and practices, to make them happy, to allow them to make a lot of money, help a lot of people and have a lot of fun, to create a collective consciousness. You see, through sports and entertainment, one of the greatest bug lights of credibility, emotional attachment, reasons, impacts, and capabilities, through sports and entertainment, I'm able to empower a thousand people like you, to empower a thousand people to be happy. A thousand times a thousand's a million, a million times a thousand's a billion. In essence, my mission in life to empower over a billion people to be happy, to create a collective consciousness of abundance, of more than enough, of this value add game as I try to explain it to people, is based upon one person at a time utilizing values and practices with bug light, with the bug light or backdrop 
just like Jerry Maguire, of sports. And because so many of us see sports in that realm, it allows me to attract more people and accelerate the learning curve exponentially. You know, that's great. You answered one of my questions, which which is how do you make a billion people happy? Uh, there is a question about women athletes, which I'd love to put up for, if our producer put it up for us. Uh, I really like uh, like this one. Letitia from Chicago asks, if you work with women athletes and what are the differences you see in the promotion of women athletes versus male athletes in your business? David? Well, I think this is a major um, illustration of equity, especially in fairness and pay. Uh, in the win, no, no more the, the USA women's soccer team, who's so much more successful than the USA men's soccer team, but is diminished in you know their financial positioning, uh, which is one of the complete uh, di- uh, things for me that that is so illustrative of the, of the disparity that exists still today. But I will tell you what I look at because I'm a person who looks for the light, the love, and the lessons to help promote change. Is that over 90, and, and I, I have to, you know, put a caveat, 99% of all statistics are made up, but I'm just going to use this one. 90% of all C-level women executives played college sports. Um, it's an amazing statistic that so many of our women executives were in and trained on the field. Uh, in the values that they learn, in the characteristics they learn on the field are completely applicable to their leadership off the field. I think that the way we treat women athletes versus male athletes is an area that guys like me, the middle-aged white male, we unlearn a lot of things. And slowly but surely, you know, I work with the Phil Quotient with Sally Zalis, uh, on this exact measure, because I think if we can create the equality on the field, uh, we also will create the quality off the field. One of the reasons I love esports uh, is to me, it's the most popular sport in the world that nobody knows about, but it has the equality of no other sport in the world. You can be any size, shape, color, religion, spirituality, sect, it doesn't gender, it doesn't matter. It's, it's the ultimate cohesive unit of sports and i can't wait for everyone in the world to start understanding the power size scope and scale of esports which is the uh, gaming industry for those who don't know well maybe a webinar on esports david that would be a good one because i'm not sure everybody knows about it sort of like cryptocurrency it's kind of a new thing that people are getting used to i would agree with you though if i look at our exceptional women awardees i would say a significant portion of them we're involved in sports, certainly at uh, the high school level, but also at the college level, and some even more than that. So I would agree with you on that. When you think about uh, your day, which is obviously very structured, uh, there's a lovely question that just came in, which I'd love to to put up there. And that's from Mariana, who says, your day is very structured. Do you just ever relax and let the day flow? Oh, my goodness. Every day. See, I do not work. I have activity I get paid for and activity I don't get paid for. I vacation every day. I meditate every day. I have non-negotiables, although my days are extremely structured and routine oriented. I also know a great way to make God laugh at me is come up with a very structured, well-developed plan. So I have non-negotiables. Believe it or not, the first two non-negotiables of my life are being the flow, meaning I spend minimum of an hour a day on my health reason I do that, and it's the best piece of advice that I can give anyone, is that if you are healthy, you get the greatest resource of all wishes. You get as many wishes a day that you want when you're healthy. If you're unhealthy, you only have one wish. So my health is a non-negotiable to my family. And I have had to re-engineer the prioritization of this because I always put my family first and then the activity I get paid for second, then my health. But what I started to realize is I never got to my health. And so now my health is primary, non-negotiable. If I'm not capable of taking care of myself, I can't take care of others. Two, my family. And let me give you a couple real quick pieces of advice about family because we're talking about this uh, work-play balance. You know, for me, one minute a day is worth an hour on a weekend. So I spend a minimum amount of time, seven days a week with my family, 30 minutes minimum with my wife, 30 minutes minimum with my 11-year-old, 
two minutes minimum with my teenage daughters. I asked for five, they gave me two. Don't think I'm a bad, I'm just a realist, but those two minutes a day are worth more than two hours on a Saturday. And then I spend a minute a day minimum, minimum with my mom. And I only tell her four things and it's established an extraordinary relationship. My mom's my hero. She raised six kids on her own, worked two jobs, literally all my to the league, story leader, second grade teacher, you know, pack her dinner in a paper bag so she could fill up turnstiles at convenience stores with greeting cards. But she created, she's an amazing empower. But I call my mom every day or meet her or text her. And I tell her four things. I'm happy. I'm healthy. I love her. And I appreciate her, meaning she had value to my life. If you explain these four things to your children or your children to you, I promise it will heal a very complex relationship of father, son, mother, son, mother, daughter, father, daughter. It's an amazing healing of one minute a day is worth so much in my life. So minimum time on my health, minimum on the family, and then a minimum amount of time with activity I get paid for. That leaves a whole bunch of time left to vacation every day, to meditate, to all, do all these other things that create what I call balance, which is a weighted balance day by day, dictated by the daily practices. Well, I really hope my son is watching this program. And if he's in, I'm going to send the link to him so that I get a call every day. Yes. Uh, David, I love the office hours uh, concept. How did you come up with that concept? What are you trying to achieve with it? And when did you start and, and what's the end goal there? I'm so blessed because when COVID hit, I wanted to utilize two things to help people. One, my situational knowledge, which uh, I you I kind of describe as a dummy tax. I don't want people to have to pay the dummy tax I paid. And then I have these extraordinary relationships from running the most notable sports agency in the world to being the CEO of Samsung's phone division to all the different experiences that I had. And so I wanted during COVID to create a platform using this one, by the way, in order to bring people on and have a conversation to teach these lessons from the greatest billionaires, millionaires, entrepreneurs, celebrities, athletes, and entertainers to carry the spirit of excellence to teach these lessons. And lo and behold, as I had other TV shows, Bloomberg was the first to kind of acknowledge, hey, you should make this into the first late night entrepreneurial show with these billionaires, millionaires, entrepreneurs, celebrities, athletes, and entertainers. So bringing Cameron Diaz on, not to talk about her movies, but to talk about her mindset, heart set, and hand set in a successful business. Danica Patrick, we saw earlier, uh, you know, amazing people uh, to compliment what we're doing in an entertaining way. So it ended up not only being on Bloomberg, but now I have a big Apple TV deal that allows us to provide more entrepreneurial content. Uh, and Office Hours is our lead show. It's the first late night entrepreneurial show uh, that allows us to learn the lessons and save on the dummy tax. Amazing. And and your brand, I mean, David, your brand is just growing and growing. Was, was this a deliberate decision to build your brand as an individual or what? I'm very blessed there as well. Five years ago, this Super Bowl, which is coming up, I met a man named Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, who I was helping him and his brother with his sports agency they were starting. And he suggested to me after reading my book that I should build my own personal brand. Now, I've always built other people's brands, companies, product services, solutions, athletes, celebrities, billionaires. I've always built their brand, but he convinced me that uh, the middle-aged mutant turtle here could actually empower other people and that by building my brand, I could reach my objective of helping people. And so I thank Gary Vaynerchuk for assisting me and giving me the belief. And then during COVID, uh, I because you know Sports One Marketing, my marketing company, had no events to go to, Super Bowl Pro, Masters, Kentucky Derby, Reader's Cup were all closed. I took all of our resources and was able to, in the last two years, put it all into my personal brand. And I know, Lorraine, since we've met, you can see the exponentiality of putting attention in on my brand and intention, what I think, say, do, believe, and feel, that have created extraordinary coincidences uh, that have blessed me, my family, and our community. Well, I would say the same for me, David, because 
the most wonderful thing that happened was that I met you a number of years ago and your generosity in donating to prize money for my students where I was an adjunct professor uh, enabled a lot of joy to be spread around. And I wish we had a whole hour more to talk to you, but unfortunately we've come to the end of our show. I want to thank you so much for giving us your time and for your insights and your wisdom. I hope you get lots more people to sign up and get those five daily practices. I know that I will be one of them. Thank you so much, David. Appreciate it. Thank you. It is not the end. We are going to bring you lots more shows. I have an amazing show planned for you with two of our exceptional women awardees. We have Jane Marcus, who is the senior client partner at Corn Ferry in Chicago. She does CEO and board placements in the financial service industries and other industries. And she is also a valued coach for many of those high level clients of Corn Ferry. And with her, we have Shiruti Miyashiro, who is the CEO of the Orange County Credit Union. She is also on the board of public company Jack Henry and on the Federal Home Loan Bank Board in San Francisco. Both of these exceptional women are going to tell us about women challenges and how they have succeeded in their industries. And so I leave you with a question today which of course we always do. And since David has inspired us so much in his inspirational goal to make a billion people happy, do you know what makes you happy? Please reply to me on my email, which is up on the screen. And remember to go to Spotify and Amazon Music, share this program, which is going to become a podcast. I'm sure you want to watch it again. There's so many insights in it. I'll see you next week. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. 